would like to welcome our peace builders to the Rotarian Action Group for Peace webinar series, Together for Peace. So we are all here today to learn about peace builders from around the world to inspire, motivate, and help you take peace action to the today. So even while we are all at home, social distancing, we are so excited to introduce Mandar Apte. Did I spell that right, Mandar Apte? <laughs> okay. Uh, Mandar represents a true person of action. Since the seventh grade, Mandar has been fascinated by adventure and serving others. As a former petroleum engineer for Shell, to now a film producer, mindfulness teacher, and founder of nonprofit Cities for Peace, Mandar has found his path to invest in ideas that create high social impact for peace building. Mandar's mission is to empower peace leaders to bring peace to those who need it the most. Mandar has helped people from all walks of life, from families impacted by shootings, activists, police officers, former gang members, and prisoners. His teachings of nonviolence has spread peace around the world. Starting from a humble office mindfulness course during lunch hour, Mandar's mission for peace building has grown to a large scale program that instills a culture of nonviolence in major cities in the most violent contexts. His program in Los Angeles brought together former gang members and police officers around mutual understanding and peace. His documentary, From India with Love, takes viewers on a beautiful journey on the culture of peace in India, as well as enlightening victims of violence of the power of inner peace. So without further ado, let's dive in to learn more about Mandar's fascinating action for peace and his journey. Mandar, do you wanna, walk, do you wanna say something before I ask you the first question to the audience? Welcome them. No, th thank you very much. You know, we are all uh, forced at home and we are all forced to innovate and keep the work going. And so your job is to uh, keep peace builders uh, on their mission. And uh, this is very innovative idea. Thank it's, you so much. Uh, true stories uh, inspire each other. We inspire each other. I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by uh, what you have also achieved in your, you know, short uh, time on the planet from coming from a challenged uh, neighborhood to where you have reached now in both your professional career as well as, you know, physically you have come far away from where you are. And so I hope that your family is doing well and I'm hoping that, you know, Everybody that you uh, touch will get the smile that you have. That Thank is so uh, catchy. The first thing we notice when we look at you is your beaming smile. Oh my gosh, that's so sweet of you, Mandar, to say. I really appreciate um, your kind words. So speaking of families, I want my first question to you is about your upbringing and how your upbringing helped you on your journey to do the great work you're doing today and what values instilled in you that you are utilizing in your peace action today? Yeah, so upbringing, my upbringing was in a middle-class uh, Indian household in uh, Mumbai in India. It's still Bombay for me because that is what we grew up with uh, before the name changed. Uh, it's a very busy city. It's like New York City 10.0. And so the thinking I had was that when you are growing up in uh, a middle-class household in a city that is fast-paced, there's a lot of competition, uh, you do get uh, a lot of exposure to different aspects of life. One of the aspects is busyness. Um, so like you in India, uh, when you're going by bus, you're waiting at a bus stop. Uh, things don't happen at the time that you want them to happen, right? So when you're waiting for a bus stop, the bus will come at its own time. And so those uh, adventures teach you patience. Whereas, uh, you know, I had, a I had the time to live in Holland and Switzerland 
where in Germany people are very like minute by minute, second by second, and if things don't happen, they get agitated. Right. So that this value of patience and caring comes from, I would say, the upbringing that I have. But one of the biggest things I remember is uh, being a fan of mysteries and books. And uh, I used to read the Hardy Boys. Uh, and I read seventh and eighth grade. I read almost all the about 100 books that uh, Franklin Dixon, the author, wrote. And every book, like, increased my imagination about mysteries and solving mysteries. And so my dream was to come to the US and meet the Hardy Boys. So that was the dream you can say that uh, teaches you the that life should have a purpose like uh, you know those two boys showed me that you could put your time in solving crime which is also reducing peace. I mean reducing violence and promoting peace. So I think those were the formative days of th the thinking about human values kindness, compassion, service, all these values, uh, now we reflect back and you know, those things shape our life. You mentioned to me, um, Mandar, in our previous conversation about how coming from a middle class family exposed you to the concept peace. So can you tell us like more about that? Like, is this part of the Indian culture? Is peace embedded in Indian culture? Is that correct? I mean, peace is part of every human being. So it's not just part of Indian uh, values. Peace is the innate nature of any human being. Uh, what keeps us away from uh, achieving that state of peace is, I would say, an inability to deal with negative emotions. So, you know, we are all like common people. We have events in our life that create negative negative emotions uh, and uh, those could be as simple as being stuck in a traffic jam or going through a relationship issue or going through uh, a crisis a disease insult like getting fired at work like all these events are part of regular human being life and uh, the innate desire of all of us is peace so what is peace peace is a state of mind where we are free of the negative emotion. So Mandar, can I ask you specifically about uh, people who are interested in inner peace? Because that's really what you um, hope to accomplish through your work. That's your strategy. So can you explain to us what is inner peace for those who don't know what inner peace is and why and what makes it so vital for peace in general? Yeah, I, I, I will give an example. The example could be uh, like somebody insults you, somebody blames you, somebody uh, is jealous of you. Whatever their position is, if that affects you, then you are no different from them. So for example, you know, if somebody has made you angry based on some actions they that have happened, uh, when you meet that person 10 days later at a party, you are struggling because you are still chewing that anger, but that person that made you angry is laughing, is smiling. They have forgotten it. That is uh, everybody's experience is uh, events, people, situations create a mental impression on you, a mental impression on you that uh, most of the times has a negative connotation, anger, frustration, jealousy, sadness, depression. You can count on both hands, 10 emotions. Inner peace is an ability to deal with those emotions such that you are angry by choice, not by default. So showing emotions is okay, but being angry is not okay. Showing anger is okay because only through that anger, you are going to discipline someone. But being angry is not okay because it leads you to your own stress related ailments, right? You get diabetes, blood pressure. And when somebody is angry, we spew that anger on people around us. So our actions uh, are impacted by that anger. So that is not good. Being angry is not good. 
showing anger is okay because then you have uh, become a master of the emotion otherwise you are a slave of the emotion right so inner peace is that fine line where you are able to manage your conflict inside keep that negative emotion aside and deal with the situation with uh, calm and ease not the other way around where the situation and the negative emotion is controlling your life and uh, coming back to indian culture i think it's part of world culture like for example uh, grandmothers tell us when you are angry count to 10 right so what does that mean this is all over the world people grandmothers will say hey, you know when you get angry don't don't shout immediately count to 10 so what happens when you count to 10 is that your mind calms down and when your mind calms down you are not doing things out of that negative outburst so that is a clue to inner peace that it is global it is every grandmother's wish uh based on you know this example of count to 10 there's no mystery in count to 10 you can count to 5 also some people may not need to count if you have mastered the emotion then uh, that is what inner peace means it doesn't mean again that you should not be angry right you can be angry but it's your choice so um mandar Can you explain to me a little bit? I want to highlight the concept of sacrifice that you've learned from your family, giving you so much love, and where you felt that peace needs to be taken farther away from just you accomplishing your inner peace. And why is that significant and important? How do you move inner peace forward? Yeah, the role of sacrifice, I think, is uh, true again, universal. But I learned it from people that I grew up with, my parents and my teachers. Uh, for example, you know, life is very hard in uh, developing countries. It's hard everywhere, but it's especially hard in countries that are, uh, uh, you know, in the developing world. So, coming from a middle class background, I remember my. parents both were working they were both uh, in move out of the house um and um, they were always focused on uh, making me and my sister make sure that we are uh, on track with education like they wanted us to be successful in order to be successful we had to study we had to work and they had to put us through like tuition classes like all this was additional expenses and they never ever put that hey we are spending so much money on you what are you doing like none of this was part of my growing up which means that uh, you know they have sacrificed uh, some of the aspects of their life to grow up uh, to good human beings that is true for every parent if you put yourself in any parent shoes so i think go, going back now because covid crisis forces you to look back uh these are like things we can all be grateful for is uh, the time that our mothers grandmothers great grandmothers someone has invested in us so that our life should be better and that is i think what uh, we need to also in improve in our life is how many other lives are am i make making better so just me being peaceful is not enough in fact my lack of peace is because of people around me was my discovery that i am peaceful but because i am working in a technical organization uh, that is all left brained logical like you know uh, it was very stressful and so in order for me to be peaceful i had to make sure that my colleagues are peaceful <laughs> <laughs> which takes me to the next question because of that you uh you were a very prominent um petroleum engineer in one of the leading organizations of the world shell in, in energy and petroleum um so you started an a, a, an amazing program there with the help of women in the organization called aware yeah it's uh, such a fun story that i enjoyed listening to uh when you shared it with me for for the first time and i can't wait for you to share it with everyone how did this program came about how did you bring peace to others in your organization and how women helped you take yeah. it forward 
Yeah, so like I said, I discovered that uh, my stress was because of people around me. I uh, joined a meditation program. Yoga meditation was not part of my upbringing. My teachers were, uh, you know, a Texan couple from Houston, Texas. So I was learning all these concepts about live in the present moment and breathing exercises from an American couple. And I felt like, wow, why didn't I do this when I was in India? So I became a teacher and then I started seeing that, hey, my stress is because of my peers at work. So uh, I was spending nine to 10 hours at work. And this was like 2003, 2004, long before the mindfulness craze has started. So I uh, brainstormed with uh, two other uh, women actually also that were my friends. And uh, we, we started an employee network within Shell called the AWARE Network. The acronym stands for At Work as Responsible Employees. Uh, focusing on self-awareness, meditation, yoga, tai chi, good food, like all these good things to bring them at the workplace so that people at the workplace are more stress-free, right? So that was the initiative, that was the idea. And the way that idea, that network came to life was uh, I reached out to the admin association network, like uh, administrative assistants of different groups within this large oil company. 99.9% .9 they are all women. And uh, that's the bottom of the food chain, right? The whole organization, this is the bottom of the food chain. But uh, they were very powerful. That session that we did, a meditation breathing exercise session for these admins, uh, you know, many of them cried like, how can we help you? Because when you become stress-free, the first thing that you start thinking about is sharing it with others, right? Mm -hmm. So that is how the, or the AWARE network built its uh, foundation is through these, uh, you know, brave women, an untapped source of any organization, in this case, administrative assistants. And they started organizing these workshops for their teams, for their groups. And I ended up teaching 2000 people at Shell how to meditate. Uh, I could not have done that on my own and uh, I think uh, women need to play a much important role in peace promotion because by nature the woman uh, lives in the heart. Emotions are very clear like emotions and women is such strong connection. So uh, my urge, my request is women need to be more dynamic. For that, you need to care for yourself. For that, you need to manage your negative emotions, for which you need to meditate. And I think you will be much effective in bringing uh, peace in the world, peace in your home. Uh, and, you know, we didn't talk about it before, but the, the woman in the home has that ability to bring the different nuts in the room on the dinner table. Right? So when the mom shouts and says, God, stop arguing, come, dinner will not be served. Like that is the power of the woman in the house. So I think that power, uh, world peace needs to have that power. Not that men are not good, but I think for women, it is natural to be a peace builder, to overcome conflict and find a common purpose and hey, stop it. Like something like this, I think. So um, can you share with us, speaking of that, uh, of women and their role around the dinner table, the metaphor or the philosophy of the apple pie uh, that you've shared about like grandmothers and the apple pie. Can you share that with the audience? Uh, my, I mean, uh, we don't have apple pie in India. So when, uh, what I mean to say here is take any sweet, right? Take any sweet. And uh, when you have apple pie, uh, you feel so good, like, wow, this is so good. And the natural thing that happens when you have that experience, that inner experience, is you want to share it with people, right? So that is the addictive quality of peace, kindness, compassion, is when you have it, you cannot just keep it. Naturally, you feel like sharing it. 
So apple pie can be replaced with baklava, for example. Right? <laughs> it could be any anything that people on this global call are used to. Like uh, take a sweet, put it in your mouth, and have that wow feeling. That same feeling comes when your mind is at peace. Is you want to share that peace with other people. I love that. I love uh, it's uh, how you simplify these concepts for us and bring it home, uh, Mandar. So I want to ask you, so then why uh, meditation is important and uh, inner peace is important for peace builders um, and Rotarian peace builders? Why is that important thing for them to adapt, to practice? Uh, how is that going to help them advance their mission for peace? Um, I discovered myself as a peace builder when I was at Shell, right? Because there are, a, there is a lot of conflict even at the workplace. In fact, even more conflict because it's coming from an ego, right? I'm better than you because I have a PhD. So you should listen to me. And because you don't have a PhD, I will not listen to you. Like all these small minded egos come in the way of conflict. Right? Right? Does that make sense? Like it, it's, it's, a, it's a conflict place, workplace. Uh, and you can stretch it all the way to conflict neighborhoods like what we see here in Los Angeles or countries like Sudan or even Mexico. Like peace building is not easy. And so if you have chosen to be a peace builder, which you know I chose to be on that track, uh, I noticed that if I am not peaceful myself, number one, I pick up the tension in the room. And number two, I'm not effective in my uh, desire to bring peace because I am not peaceful. So that's where I think every peace builder needs to focus their attention on building that capacity for inner peace. So that number one, you are more happy, healthy. Uh, you're not spending too much on drugs and medical health, right? And number two, that inner peace, that state of mind, that peaceful, happy, conscious state of mind will make you more effective in getting the job done of conflict resolution. Because conflict resolution is a very difficult job. Not everybody is willing to listen to each other especially if you are in a multi-stakeholder dialogue with you know different parties involved uh, holding that space as a peace builder should is a very draining experience so that is where meditation breathing exercises inner peace practices will not only help the peace builder in terms of being uh, happy healthy themselves but intuitive ability will increase. So you'll be more effective in your job. People will be more uh, attracted to working with you. So Mandar, uh, speaking of that, you became um, a peace builder through the different um, initiatives and projects that you've led. And you've shared your apple pie with the rest of the world, starting or one of, one of the things you've shared with us and humanity is the documentary you've produced uh, to share your journey of peace with others who've suffered from violence and how the journey transfer transformed them. So I wanted to ask you about the documentary a little bit. So what inspired you to make this film and why it was important for you to highlight um, and relate the nonviolence to inner peace? Yeah. Um, I have been a meditation teacher for the last 16 years. I have taught thousands of people, including 2000 people at Shell, where I used to work. So I knew that it works and it works. I, I personally benefit from it and whoever I have taught also benefits from it. Four years ago, while I was still at Shell, I had gone on a one month holiday to India where my parents live. And uh, four years ago, this country where I reside now, the United States, went through its election cycle. And so I was watching on television this election debates, and I didn't like what I was seeing on television. That um, that was not the America I came in 25 years ago. 
So I picked up a book, uh, the autobiography of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I was reading that book as I was traveling home. Uh, you know, in India, we don't learn about Martin Luther King Jr. We don't learn about civil rights. We learn about India's freedom struggle, Gandhi's life. But we do know that Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela brought Gandhi's nonviolence practices in their own uh, freedom struggles. So while I was reading this book, I read 30 pages of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's little known journey to India that he had made as a young man. Uh, his mentor had told him to travel to India to uh, learn from the source what nonviolence is. And so that for me was that day a discovery, like, oh my God, I didn't know that MLK had physically been to India. So I called some of my American friends and uh, apparently not many people know. So that was the insight that day is when MLK went, Gandhi had died. So Gandhi and King never had a Starbucks together. Like, hey, dude, how did you to nonviolence activism, right? They didn't have that conversation. So when MLK went, uh, he learned it from the people of India, from the travel in India, from the culture of India, was my hypothesis. So that became the need of the hour is, uh, I thought of recreating that same journey. And I thought of bringing victims of violence from America on both sides of the gun and all skin color to travel the footsteps of Martin Luther King Jr. in India and to test whether the culture of India, the people and wisdom of India, does it transform this delegation of victims of violence. So that is the documentary film. It's a real story, an unscripted story of uh, how these uh, brave individuals who trusted me on a phone call and uh, from the time that I had the book, the discovery, to completing the production of the film took me one month. Having no experience in making films, knowing nobody in this uh, participant group. So that is where I also like, uh, I'm indebted to so many people that helped me to produce this film. So Mandar, I, I watched your documentary and it's truly inspiring. And um, I've, I'm a fan of all the heroes and the peace builders in your documentary. Can you share with the audience some of the transformative stories um, of the documentary? Like uh, who are, like, can you share the story, for example, of Scarlett um, who lost her child to um, mass shooting? Um, would you like to share how she was transformed by that journey? Yeah, I, I will share. Um, most people know of uh, gun violence and uh, shootings in the U.S. schools. Uh, it's sad, but that is uh, like a disease. And it's like an epidemic, right? So the, one of the darkest, darkest days of my adult life was the day when we all heard about the shooting in that Sandy Hook school for uh, six year old kids, first grade kids. 20 children were murdered that day. Uh, the murderer was not a terrorist. The murderer was a 15 year old boy from that same neighborhood. And he ended up also killing seven teachers in that school. One of them was his mom. And then he murdered himself. Right? He took his own life. That was a very dark day in uh, my adult life. So Scarlett is one of the parents from uh, that sad school shooting. And I would say she's a very inspiring, very caring, very dynamic uh, woman peace builder. Because having gone through such a life experience, to uh, now for as we speak now she is uh, bringing a program on socio emotional learning in school curriculums like she is now becoming a part of the solution and so having her on this journey with me four years ago 
uh, she when I was introduced to her, I was speaking with her just like we are speaking on FaceTime. And I told her about my dream that I want to recreate Martin Luther King's uh, footsteps. Will you like to come? She asked me, what's the name of your project? So I said, from India with love, because that's what I feel Martin Luther King brought back. So as soon as she heard love, she said, I'm in. Because that is what is missing in the world. So that was the first uh, like experience of Scarlett is she didn't doubt. She said she jumped in like, yes. And then she said, okay, let me check if I can uh, find a babysitter for my, the second kid she has. Like that's an interesting quality, right? To uh, say yes for anything that is good and then worrying about the details later, like logistics later. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the six people have their own acts of uh, uh, compassion and uh, they are all great people, great human beings. I love, I love this story of the mayor and, you know, I, you know, Scarlett is such an inspiring story um, of a woman who overcame that stra the tragedy. And um, I love what she said at the end uh, by the river when she said, I've never felt more peaceful like this before since the shooting. Um, so that's obviously a journey that brought her peace that she was looking for. And now she's bringing it to others. But on the cute note, I love the story about the mayor that you shared with us. Yeah. And uh, I, I would like you to share it with, uh, with the audience. Yeah, uh, so you, the, this film is now available on Amazon Prime and uh, it's been four years since that trip that I took. And every time I watch that film, I'm also reminded of the backstories because that project was completed in one month. And it was like whitewater rafting. Like I had no time to think what I'm doing. It was just do and do <laughs> and do, right? Uh, since then, I have taken about 100 leaders to India. Uh, this has included mayors, police chiefs, police officers, former gang members, peace activists, like a spectrum of people I have taken on these delegations. Uh, it's not a vacation. Yes, you do get to see the Taj Mahal. Yes, you do get to take pictures, but it's a deep dive into practice of nonviolence. And uh, you come back as a transformed uh, individual leader. And hopefully you will bring the change in your own world, in your own neighborhoods. Right? So that is the idea of From India With Love, is uh, uh, building your leadership capacity so that you can be an effective peace builder. One such person who came on the journey was a mayor, uh, about 70 year old, I think. And he was the mayor of Rochester, Rochester, Minnesota. It's where the Mayo Clinic is. It's famous for the Mayo Clinic. So uh, mayor uh, has been married for 50 years and uh, mayor was by the Taj Mahal and he started weeping and he was very emotional because this was the first time he had left his childhood sweetheart for 10 days and she was, uh, she has dementia. So she was in an old age home and uh, he, I, I was just, it was just very cute to see such a leader of a big city uh, making himself vulnerable and uh, sharing his love for his wife, his childhood sweetheart, who's not with him at the Taj Mahal. Uh, that was so beautiful for me to experience. Like I wish at the age of 70, I'm able to keep that innocence and that, you know, loving spirit alive so peace building requires you to have that human side of life otherwise you are just a robot right so love and happiness and these beautiful moments peace builders we need to soak ourselves in those moments because it's like cleansing it's like giving a wash right all our hard work needs to have a masu right you know? So these moments of love and happiness are uh, very important for a peace builder because you are connecting back to your own humanity. In the mayor, I saw me, right? So 
It's beautiful. I, I really love that story because, you know, he was triggered by the story of Taj Mahal and how that journey helped him reflect on his own love for his wife and how um, much love he felt for her. And um, I love what you mentioned earlier about how this maintains the child spirit within within him. And that's an indication of uh, of love and peace and purity that we all should be striving to achieve. Um, I love the story also of the the prisoners who um, um, who came with you on the journey, who are now now free. They left prison and they're helping um, push this message forward in, to other prisoners. Um, can you share with us about them and what they've done to help prisoners in India? Yeah, uh, so just to set the context. Uh, when my film started screening in different cities and I got invited as a, you know, director, Q&A, uh, you get exposed to certain neighborhoods. Like this screening was in south side of Chicago, very violent neighborhood. And uh, you get to feel the tension that is prevalent in the United States between communities of color and police. And uh, if I, four years ago, as a privileged Shell employee, I had no, I used to read these news, but I was not soaking in the people that are facing these challenges. So I decided to take that, uh, that year, 2018, I took police officers and members of the communities of color on my From India With Love trip to India, about 34 of them. So. 34 people, 17 cops and 17 community of color representatives. I was holding that space 10,000 miles away. And uh, one such person that had come was a former gang member, uh, was uh, incarcerated at uh, age 18 and he spent 32 years in prison. Seven years was in solitary confinement. And uh, after watching my documentary, he got inspired and uh, he signed up and uh, we, we are still, we are very good friends. But what I learned from, you know, this individual and other such individuals that I have uh, met is their uh, ability to uh, give back. So uh, coming to India, I, of course, we did the breathing exercise, meditation practices, meeting the people of India. And then I brought him to speak at the largest prison in India. And uh, all the prisoners in that prison have done the breathing and meditation workshops. So they were telling Nate that if they had learned how to manage their emotions, they would not be in the prison. And so Nate was touched by this. So when he came back to LA, he organized a workshop for his friends and community. Right. So that was for me like a very interesting attitude is not only to taste peace, but to share it with your loved ones, just like the apple pie analogy we gave, we spoke. And Nate Williams uh, is still like every day he goes to some jail and writes letters to the inmates where he was telling them about the good life that is outside and uh, gives workshops for juveniles and young people of uh, the life that he has lost. He's lost 32 years of his life. And so the mistakes that he made, not to make those mistakes. So I think it's a beautiful uh, way of looking at peace building is to prevent violence. Right. So peace building doesn't need to be just go in conflict areas and solve conflict, but it could also have a prevention aspect to it is go to neighborhoods where you are uh, at risk and uh, prevent people from going into that pipeline. I like that uh, because violence is present in every, every place possible. There's violence. It could be systematic. It could be in attitudes, it could be in hate speech or discrimination um, in, in policies or structures. Um, and so every time you are helping someone in such, um, in, in a violent place or in a violent situation, 
you are promoting peace and you are building peace because you're empowering them to overcome this without violence. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, which takes me to your um, initiative, Cities for Peace. You realize that violence exists in our cities um, and you wanted to tackle this issue. So you created this initiative. Uh, can you highlight for us an example of a project that Cities for Peace has done, uh, more particularly um, the work you've done in Los Angeles with the police and um, um, gang members there. It's one of the most, uh, Los Angeles is one of the most uh, violent cities um, in the US. And how did you think you could bring peace to that city? What did you do to bring peace to that city through Cities for Peace? Yeah. Um... The relationship with the city of Los Angeles started with uh, a public screening of my documentary film that was hosted by the police department. And about 400 people came from the greater Los Angeles community to experience the documentary film. And at the end of the film, uh, I led people through a breathing exercise and a meditation practice. And uh, people started uh, inviting me to their neighborhoods. So I got invited to the neighborhood. It's called South Central Los Angeles. It's also referred to as the gang capital of the world. There are more gang members in that neighborhood than any other city. Um, so the Los Angeles police chief told me that uh, uh, he would love to send all of South Central to India but that's not feasible. So can you bring India to Los Angeles? Right? So that was like a problem statement that had uh, an interesting challenge. So for me, that was exciting. So I reloc relocated to Los Angeles last year and uh, we asked them to provide us with a neighborhood that is the most violent in Los Angeles. And then I said, uh, let's bring opposite sides in the same room. So we uh, reached out to uh, the gang leaders of these communities and <laughs> somehow we brought them in the same room with the police department. And we added the victims of violence from that neighborhood. So we added parents, teachers, youth, who have also gone through trauma, who have lost uh, you know, their family members to the gang violence. So that uh, is how we created that experiment that seemingly opposite people who have nothing in common can come together in the shared mission of promoting peace. Right. So which means that uh, they have one thing in common is trauma. So that healing the trauma is the mission that they all came together to learn how breath yoga meditation practices can heal you from your trauma. And gang members have trauma, police officers have trauma and community members also have trauma. So that was the basis of them to come together. And uh, then as the trauma heals, when you meditate and breathe, you know, after a few weeks, uh, we started adding things to the experience of these uh, participants where we added uh, spoken word poetry, like cops and gangsters came and wrote poetry, uh, graffiti painting. So these experiences show each other that we are all human and we are all uh, here for a short time. And we all have now experienced peace. And if we all had this inner peace, improved quality of life, we may not have gone in that wrong track. So sir, let's bring this to places where there is a need for peace. So schools, then we started doing workshops in the neighborhood schools. So that is how the experiment has blossomed is empower people. And then, you know, as they discover the peace and joy within, Naturally, they want to share it with their loved ones, their own community. 
So that is how the LA experiment has blossomed, and now we have been invited by Miami and uh, done workshops in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, so it's uh, it's an invitation to people who are watching this webcast: is uh, if you are interested in promoting peace and uh, compassion in your own neighborhoods, uh, let's do something together. You know, because there is a mini Los Angeles everywhere. In every big city, there is an inner city. Absolutely. And on this note, I want to uh, reveal our little gift and surprise for our members uh, who are watching and Beast Builders that um, we've worked with Mandar to provide you with a special workshop uh, for Rotarians and Rag for Peace members um, that you can sign up for and take action for peace from the comfort of your home. Uh, there is the, we want to introduce to you the Sky Mindful Leadership program uh, that will be available through Mandar um, to our Rag for Peace members. And um, we will follow up with this information after the webinar. So feel free to uh, register. And also we would like to invite you as well to take action for peace by watching Mandar's documentary and enjoy um, going on the journey with him uh, for peace um, in that documentary in, uh, from India. And um, we also are planning youth uh, program through the RAG also for young people and interactors um, who later will join a special workshop tailored for youth. And we're doing all this um, uh, through the RAG for Peace and our collaboration with Mandar's a great program to um, empower our peace builders to join on a journey for peace together. Mandar, would you like to say something to that and why it is important for the RAG members to join um, and how this is a great opportunity for them to engage? What does the workshop entail? Like, what is, does it look like? So if they're interested in joining and taking part in this, what they should be doing? Yeah, the introductory workshop consists of some group discussions, uh, some interactive processes, but mostly it will be based on the science of breath, that every emotion has a corresponding breathing pattern. So when someone is angry, frustrated, sad, we will notice that our breath pattern is different. Like when someone is angry, we are breathing fast and shallow. When somebody is uh, sad, our exhale is longer. When we are anxious, we are short breaths. But when we notice when we are happy, we breathe from our navel and our smile shows up. So this is the science of the breath that emotions have their own breathing patterns and the reverse is also true. So the cornerstone of this workshop will be different breathing exercises for you to master how to get over your negative emotions. And uh, once you learn this, then you will be able to teach this to your community, to your own circle of friends, to you in your own peace building work. So I think uh, because we are all in a state of lockdown, uh, it will be good to use this time to learn more about ourselves, how we can improve our emotional intelligence and be better peace builders. Also, it brings you to a community of like-minded and like-hearted people sharing the same breathing together in meditation and reflections as well. Um, and healing through that process to become more empowered peace builders to take peace forward. Um, everyone is asking, where is that your documentary, this amazing documentary? I believe it's on Amazon Prime. Um, is there other places where people can find it, Mandar? Uh, I am still trying to put it on other platforms that are more uh, global. Uh, so for now, just email me and I we will find a way to send the link. But for people in the United States and people in the UK, the film is now on the Amazon marketplace. So you awesome. can rent it on Amazon or get it for free if you are a member of Prime. Okay, so um, Anna, if you can share with us the, um, the slide on the times of uh, Mandar's workshop upcoming through the RAG again, so we can uh, spell it out loud for people who are watching. I believe we've scheduled it for, I'm not gonna share it, but I wanna make sure. It's, um, 
This is Mandar's email. Yeah. Okay. So the adult intro will be on Wednesday, April 15th at 5.30 to 7 p.m. Pacific time. And that would be next week, Wednesday. So there will be an adult intro. After that intro, if you are interested, there will be an extensive workshop uh, in May. And that workshop, intensive workshop, Mandar would be for like four days and um, it will four be hours. two hours every day. Yeah, so it, um, and it will be a spread um, on a weekend. So it will be like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Um, the same would go also for um, the, the week after the adult intro. So the adults who have enjoyed that experience and they want to bring in um, their um, um, grandchildren or uh, interactors. So if you are a Rotarian in a Rotary Club who um, has interactors, uh, please invite them uh, to join the youth intro. Uh, that will be the Wednesday after April 15th, and that would be April 22nd. Um, and it's the same time, 5.30 to 7 uh, p.m. Pacific time. So it's a great opportunity for um, adults and youth um, in, in Rotary and beyond to join this uh, program and take this time of the coronavirus for us to build our inner peace and reflect on um, our journey for peace together. Um, so Mandar, before we wrap it up uh, for Q&A, would you like to share um, a wisdom from someone you inspires you? I know that one of your biggest inspirations is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who's um, an amazing um, um, peace and uh, peace leader and a thoughtful uh, thought uh, leader um, in our worlds, and he's inspiring you. So, is there any wisdom or um, value or story from uh, Sri Sri that you'd like to share with the rest of us? Yeah, um, I will say that I have been following Sri Sri's teachings since 2002, so 18 years. Uh, I have traveled with him. I have, uh, you know, have had many personal conversations with him. So for me, he is uh, my dearest friend, philosopher, guide. And the word guide in India is the source of the word guru. So he's a guru. Guru simply means a guide. So uh, his website is srisri.org. So maybe we can type it here. Or if Anna can type it. So this is the link that I will share with uh, people who are here. He is India's foremost uh, meditation teacher. And uh, he uh, is a no-nonsense guru. So he doesn't believe just in inner peace, but he is uh, very dynamic in his action, in his service. Uh, for peace builders here, you might have heard of the conflict in Colombia with the FARC uh, gorillas and the terror of the gorillas. So Sri Sri also was instrumental in uh, negotiating that peace accord between the FARC and the Colombian government. So for me, he is not just uh, you know a guru, but he's also an action guru. So it's peace in action. So one day I was uh, struggling with. Uh, some conflict at the workplace. Uh, I had a very tough relationship with one of my former bosses. And uh, I luckily bumped into Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, the Indian guru, in the New Jersey airport. So I didn't plan it, I just happened to be in the same airport. And uh, there were only three people. And that's very rare because if you follow him on the internet, you will see that there will be thousands of people chasing him around him, asking questions. Here we were only three people inside the airport. And so I got my guru time, uh, which, you know, I was, it was surprising for me to get this time. So we walked in New Jersey airport for 15 minutes. And during this time, he told me three things are important in life, especially for a peace builder. The first is passion. You need to have passion about your cause. 
if you as a peace builder are not passionate about peace you will not be effective right so you you need to have passion for your cause the second is you need to be you need to have dispassion so what does dispassion mean dispassion means the ability to switch off your mind and have a good night sleep this is a skill right because we are so passionate if people don't have you know easy sleep which means things are bothering them this is a skill peace builders need to learn is how to switch off so that you can sleep peacefully so you need to have passion dispassion and the third word is compassion all the time hmm. because things will not work at the pace you want them to work people will be around you that you know will not understand your vision so you need to have compassion for them and it starts with self compassion so it was for me very important uh, to hear it because the other thing he says and that's where i will end is violence ends where love begins so whoever you love very rarely you will be violent even in the words you use and even if you use those words let's say you use some harsh words to your mom or to your family in that heated moment right because you love them you will be the first to say sorry i'm sorry that sorry will come only when you have love for that person and you value that relationship you are prepared to say sorry or sorry i made a mistake right so violence ends where love begins i this is so beautiful mandar and inspiring one last question before we open it for q and a what would be a message for from you that you would like to give to people who are traumatized um people what would be a uh, something useful for them to do um at this moment at this time in the coronavirus uh people who are sad or you know have gone through a difficult experience what would be your advice to them uh so it, everyone has some pain in their life right life is associated with pain whatever that event or situation that caused the pain that will be different for different people but pain is part of life but suffering is optional it does that make sense right pain is part of life but whether to choose to suffer or not is my choice so if as peace builders if we want to transform that trauma that pain into uh love and kindness and compassion it needs to start within like you need to have compassion for your own spirit that has gone through this trauma this pain uh what will be useful is this science of the breath because breath is universal breath is irre irrespective of whether you are man or a woman you know indian chinese hindu muslim you are all breathing and this science is very simple emotions have their own breathing patterns reverse is also true use your breath to manage your emotions so for anybody who has gone through pain trauma think of uh, the action we do every day which is brush our teeth the first time you learned it when you were a baby this stick in your mouth we hated it but today we don't leave our home hopefully before we brush our teeth why because we don't want dental hygiene we we want our hygiene to be good right the same is true with mental hygiene so as peace builders see if you can practice breath meditation work every day 5 minutes every day 10 minutes every day we can do a few exercises now if you want well i want to um leave that to the end of the after the q and a we would like to leave some time at least 10 minutes for us to do for you to lead us on a breathing and meditation um exercise before so everyone leaves with energy of your words and stories and actions that they can take and also feel um feel it in their hearts 
So I will not delay anymore. We're 3 p.m. now, and we will take um, the amazing questions we've received from our members. There's this a uh, great question from Allison, who was our chair. Yeah. She said, you talk about inner peace and the need to always be in that state so that others around are able to sense that. How does a peace builder or maker challenge things which are wrong and very bad? Can the peace builder be assertive in a meeting whilst it not restoring to bad words and bad behavior? So how can you maintain this balance, Mandar, between standing for what's right? Sometimes, you know, you could be surrounded by manipulative people or people who um, take your kindness um, and take advantage of your kindness. Uh, people who would assume that your, kind, your kindness is weakness. So how can you maintain that grounded um, power for standing for what's right without turning into be someone like them. You don't want to mirror their manipulative behavior or their harsh harshness. Yeah, Alison, great question. I think it's a very sensitive question because as a peace builder, you can be taken for a ride if you demonstrate uh, kindness and softness. Uh, but actually think of that as your strength, right? That is your strength. And if you don't provocate things, if you don't be a disruptor and get people uh, shaken, you will not be doing your job. So you do need to do that as well without being taken for a ride, right? So it's a fine balance between the two. And in a way, you have answered that question yourself that if you are peaceful, which means you have access to that calm and you are using your words, your actions to shape other people's actions in a certain way, uh, that is your strength. And for that, you need to be more mindful, more alert, more conscious. And that is what meditation practice allows you to do effortlessly. Which takes me to the second question. So this is from Susan. She says, for someone who's new to meditation, it is very overwhelming with all the resources that are, are available. Uh, she said she has tried many apps and has gone through books, uh, but she doesn't know which things are right for her. So what would you like to recommend um, for, a source, for a resource for beginners like Susan? What, where can we start? Susan, by asking this question, you have already started. <laughs> So uh, just stay for the next uh, 20 minutes. I will teach you a few breath exercises. I will teach you a few meditation practices. And then I will also put you, uh, if you email, then I will also send you a, a few apps. I can also send you a link to a meditation in my voice. Like all these resources I will send you. So stay back, uh, enjoy the practices that I will share. If you like them, then we can provide you with more. Uh, meditation is like sports. There are different sports. So there are different ways of meditation. Choose the sport that you like. Like if you have tennis elbow, you cannot play tennis. If you have shin splint, you cannot run. So maybe chess is your game. Right? So the same is true with breath and meditation practices also, Sujan. That's great. Um, so this is a great question from Nick. Um, he says, what would be your single biggest suggestion for mindful non-reaction? So I think it builds on Allison's previous question. How can you not react? Mindful non-reaction. Do you have comments on this, Mondar? Did you get the answer? Huh? How was it when I was not answering? I mean, that's not reaction, mindful not reaction. Correct. So that sometimes you have to give that through silence, through not reacting is being quiet, which means you need to be used to doing nothing. Right? So that practice of meditation allows you to do nothing daily and which builds your capacity to 
respond, not react. So basically, are you saying, Mandar, that sometimes the best answer is to not answer at all if it's not worth our energy, uh, but we should be also mindful of how to react because I'm trying to build on what Allison asked before. So sometimes the best action is to do nothing and, and be in silence and reflect and wait until the right opportunity arises or the, when we are in the right mindset to respond. So you agree? Perfect. Okay. Well, if I get, if I get your <laughs> approval, I'm happy. No, uh, beautifully answered. Okay. Beautifully answered. And I would just say sometimes is not the right word. When you meditate every day, it will be all the time, not sometimes. I like that. Yeah. So, um, the, there's an interesting question by Eunice. I, I believe Eunice is from Morocco, Marrakesh. Um, regarding cultural and religious differences and misconceptions, how can peace builders be effective in multicultural communities? So if you are, you know, there's stereotypes all over. And actually there's research that shows that many people consider themselves not biased, but in reality, their subconscious acts as they're so biased. So, you know, even if you, even if the best people can be biased, that's what the science is telling us. So how for people from different faiths and cultures um, operate within that stereotypical, you know, way of viewing them? Yeah, so, so firstly, you know, uh, you know, thank you for asking this question and uh, uh, people, people, people are different. So, you know, there will be differences between any two people, right? Whether even if there are four people living in a family, you can think of them as four different people because they are having different choices, preferences, biases, right? Just because I live with four people in my home doesn't mean that everything I will agree with. So that same principle, uh, we have to learn how to uh, implement is agree to disagree, right? There are disagreements even in a family, but just because we disagree on one thing, we don't like create a, a turbulent situation. We say, okay, I agree to disagree with him on this, but let's keep our attention on, let's say raising our kids together. Right. Let's agree on that. Let's disagree on others. So this ability of uh, choosing what to agree and what to disagree is a inner cap capacity building that peace builders need to do. And regarding religious differences uh, as a peace builder, uh, think of religion as the banana skin and spirituality as the banana. So people might have different ways of praying or if you are an atheist, not praying, but the prayer leads you to the human values, to the humanity inside you, the banana. So as a peace builder, see if you can learn to be spiritual, where you have tasted the banana, you have tasted kindness, happiness, compassion, which are the qualities of the banana. And then you honor every peel that takes you to the banana. What have, what, how does it make a difference if I pray this way or this way or this way or this way? So you start honoring all the peels. And as a peace builder, I think we need to have that extra ability to move people through the banana peel and taste the banana in their own religious community. That we start recognizing that we are all human irrespective of which faith we follow. I, I love this example of the banana it makes it, uh, you know, drives it home. I want to also add to uh, Eunice that, um, you know, as beast builders, we should not be reactive to the stereotypes. We should stay grounded. And I feel that meditation and wisdom and breathing allows us to remember 
uh, what what is unique about us and that we shouldn't be reacting to other people's reactions. We just view that, that with compassion and help educate them. I think every time there is a misunderstanding or misconception, it's an opportunity for us to educate and um, with, with kindness, you know, not in a condescending matter. You, you educate people by showing up and being the best version of yourself. And if they choose not to learn, that's their problem. They have not learned. If, if you've done your part. So don't, don't stress about people who are not willing to learn and focus on those who are willing to learn. And yeah. not, don't lose yourself in the process. So that's my advice for you. Um, very well, I mean, so beautiful. What you have expressed just now is very beautiful. Thank you, Mandar. Well, I've learned from Sri Sri myself. So <laughs> we, we are graduates from the same school in a way. Uh, yeah. so you know, you tell you should share about the time in your life that you went through this training because that was a very young age, and I think you should share a little bit about. I discovered it while you were speaking that hey, you have already gone through the training, and you should also share that uh, you want to reconnect with what you have been trained. Yeah, I will join. Discovery is hey, I learned it, but I I need to use it. <laughs> Well, I can share that through the course when I joined the RAG for Peace members. Yeah. Um, and then we can, I can share with them. But I want to give the opportunity for the, if we have a minute left, I will. But I want to yeah. focus on addressing all the audience questions. Okay, there are two more. Okay, so there's this question from Peace Fellow Maria, who says, your film shows how the culture of India empowers victims of violence with different tools. How could we do the same in our Western societies? So Maria is asking, how can we connect the learnings from your uh, documentary and bring that back home to Western societies? Yeah, so, so my documentary uh, focuses on two uh, aspects. One is an inner journey for which you don't need to travel to India. You can take that inner journey through workshops on breath and meditation, which we will, of course, start facilitating. But if you're uh, in, in a particular country, for example, we can put you in touch with the art of living teachers in those countries. So you don't have to go to India. The workshop, the training uh, is coming to you in your own neighborhoods. The second aspect of my journey is an outer journey through travel travel in India in this case. Uh, again, you don't have to travel to India. If you come to India, that's great. But if through some challenges, you're not able to come to India, then travel to a distant land, maybe the next city or the next country. Because what this travel journey is going to expose you is how to look at your own problem from a different lens. Right? So Western society is not different from Eastern society. This division is only man-made by the Western and Eastern. Right? So the humanity is the same. So that is where the science of the breath is the same. So learn some breath meditation practices and the wisdom is not Eastern wisdom. It's universal wisdom. And actually that's what the coronavirus just taught us. It doesn't discriminate. We are all human. We're all in this together. Uh, we're all, uh, you know, vulnerable to uh, to a virus, but also to violence and to oppression. Um, and we are all revived by love and compassion and support. And with yeah, it's like a, it's like a bee has stung you, right? With this coronavirus, like if you reflect today, just I was reading today's uh, like highlights: Israel and Palestine are cooperating on COVID. <laughs> Can you have imagined that COVID has brought, at least in spirit, the two sides, right? The same thing is true about uh, communities in neighborhoods, that like violence levels have dropped. Yes, I, I hope that we can take the lessons from coronavirus to advance peace, the peace agenda. I feel that uh, as we're trying to successfully prevent the coronavirus from spreading, we can also do the same for violence. Yeah, um, it only come when we become more spiritual, when we taste the banana, right? So that is where 
just yesterday, uh, Shri Shri is leading meditations twice a day on YouTube. Yesterday, two million people meditated on YouTube. That's a massive. It's like a peace bomb, right? So <laughs> as peace builders, <laughs> as builders, this opportunity to go on YouTube and just uh, explore the secrets of your breath. I I love I love that um, Mandar I, about Sri Sri's meditations. I will definitely join them. Um, one last question from yeah. Allison. Um, she says, "Being a person of peace is a conscious decision." Yeah. Do you also think that it helps for those with the faith, all faiths, um, as it should be outworking of their faith? I don't understand the question. <laughs> Can um, you... Let me try to wrap it up. Uh, all faith as it should be outworking of their faith. So basically she's saying, does it help for people to capitalize on, on their faith, regardless of what their faith is, to bring that inner peace um, forward? Does it help? As, well, yeah. inner peace, I think inner peace is part of every faith. We just don't, don't look for it deeper in our faith. We get stuck with the practices and the symbols, right? So take, for example, Christianity. People are desperate to go to Sunday church, right? That's a practice. And in the church, they're on the phone. <laughs> So you're saying we should purify our intentions. You can call yourself even a peace builder, but you're if you're not a peace builder within, you're not really truly a peace builder. You I can't so. be anything. You can call yourself anything, but are you? So that's the question where meditation and breathing and self-reflections allow you to discover and explore. I think so. And every faith, like the banana, the purpose is love, happiness, compassion. So if you are part of any faith, whichever faith it is, go deeper in that faith. And you will see that it is the same. It's not different from other messages. And that's an invitation for everybody uh, to explore their passion. So if you are a peace builder, there's always a room for peace builders to become more compassionate peace builders, more helpful, more effective. If you are a Muslim, a Christian, a Jewish, or not of non-faith, you can always have an opportunity to become uh, a better person by learning about others, by empowering yourself to become a better person for yourself and others as well. So you can share the apple pie. Yeah, I, I mean, for example, if you go to a church, right, or to a mosque, usually they pray for only Christians or Muslims, right? But if you are truly a concerned human being, you would pray for the health and well-being of all people, irrespective of their faith. Right? So that is where our growth is that who do you think belongs to me? Is it people that look like me? Is it people of my faith? Is it people of my country? Then you have a long way to go because you have chosen to keep boundaries between you and others. And that's the beauty of Rotary. I mean, I know there is great people in all faiths who pray for all, for everybody. Um, you know, I know that, you know, in Rotary, that's what brings us. We are non-religious, non-partisan, non-political, right. and we help communities regardless of their faith, regardless of their race, regardless of their political affiliation. Right. And our, our um, mission is revolves around humanity and advancing humanity and that's why i have pride in uh being part of rotary's mission and the rag for peace and um and that's what inspires us as peace builders in this community to come together every day so mandar i want to thank you so much because i want to give everybody the chance to tap into your meditation and breathing before 3 30 because i know that you need to leave um and um do you want me to share quickly before we start about um, Shri Shri? Yeah, your experience of uh, the yeah, cause long, long time ago that came in your life. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to share that I invite you all to be part of this training uh, that Mandar is really uh, is preparing through the RAG. 
it's, it's really important for peace builders to have this opportunity to really find um, their inner peace uh, because I, I, I've seen it transforming my own life. I went to um, uh, Germany um, and I stayed in an ashram and Guru, uh, Shri Shri actually was there, led meditations and gave us wisdom uh, through a program called This We Can. So I was there as youth uh, many years ago um, in my early 20s and it has been a transformative journey for me. Uh, it made me more grounded and empowered me in times of um, pain or crisis or problems or when people were hostile to me or situations. So I invite you all to be part of that um, uh, program because I've been through it in a similar program um, in the past through my training and in the ashram. And I know that Mandar is, is going to bring it home to all of you. So Mandar, without further ado, let's get to action, peace action and help us lead this. Yeah. There is one question from uh, somebody in the UK, is it Alison? I think we've answered all the questions. No, she's saying, somebody is saying, I don't remember who it was, but they are saying because of the time difference, these workshops will be very late. Could you consider doing it in the morning as well? So I think depending on the interest, we can. Uh, and if you want to take a lead and organize it, so which means bring people in the Rotary groups in the UK or Europe together, then we can do it in the morning time in California, which will be evening time for you. So the answer is yes, but uh, just reply to Anna and uh, be like a focal point or a node to uh, help organize it there as well. Yeah, we will definitely make this, we're piloting this, like not piloting, that you're piloting this this week, but um, we will make this available at, for other RAG members at different times, but we're starting with this timing and we will coordinate with Mandar off call. Okay, so with the limited time we have left, let me teach you two exercises that you can do at home. The first exercise is very simple. You might even think, hey, why didn't I do this before? No, before we do this, left hand on your chest, right hand on your belly. Left. Left. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there is no magic but I uh, I like it this way so what we do now is we take deep breaths we fill up our lungs and we fill up our belly and then we relax our lungs and we relax our belly and this we do with our eyes closed so let's close our eyes let's take a deep breath in fill up your belly first then fill up your chest and breathe out, relax your chest and squeeze your navel in. Continue breathing in, bloat your tummy, expand your chest and breathe out, relax your chest, squeeze your navel and continue this with your eyes closed. Mindfully fill up your tummy, fill up your belly. Then fill up your chest. And mindfully, slowly breathe out, relax your chest. Relax your navel. Let's do this five times. Breathe in with a smile. Breathe out. Continue. Observe your own breath, the source of our life. No breath, no life. Mindfully breathe in and breathe out. Once again, breathe in Breathe out Final round, breathe in 
bloat your stomach. Nobody is watching, breathing. And breathe out. Keeping your eyes closed, relax your hands on the laps. And notice the sensations, any warm feelings, tingling feelings, just observe. Long, deep inhale and breathe out. And slowly we may open the eyes. How was it, Reem? It was amazing. I feel just energized and a sense of calmness. Yeah, so this can be easily used to fall asleep at night. If you are tossing around, just use this exercise. And 10 breaths, long deep breaths, you will knock yourself out, right? You will have very easy sleep. I want to ask everyone in the chat, if how did that exercise go for you? If you liked it, yeah, type right. yes. Oh, type right. yes, yes, yes. Um, in, the, uh, in the chat box. So... Oh, thank you, Dean. I'm glad you liked it. Okay. Um, more? You want to learn one more? Okay. Can we do it while you are saying what's your dream for our world and what kind of impact you want to have on our world, um, Mandar? Because you are an amazing leader, inspiring individual. And so if you had a dream for our world or an impact you want to leave in our world, what would that be? That's a deep question. <laughs> maybe after after the breathing, maybe it will come to you and you can end it at that note. So let's have one more because people like it. It seems people are loving this. So let's give them one more and then as... So this is again very simple. Some of you who may be already doing yoga may already be knowing this exercise. This is very simple. In the workshop, we will go deeper. Yes. This exercise is called alternate nostril breathing. I will demonstrate, then we will do it together. Okay. Put your right thumb on the right nostril. Inhale, exhale from the left nostril. Inhale from the left nostril. Switch and exhale from the right nostril using the same hand. Then you inhale from the right nostril. Switch, exhale from the left nostril. No, Reem, you use the same hand. You put your right thumb on the right nostril. You're confusing me. Come on, let's do it slowly because if I don't follow, I don't think others are. <laughs> you put your right thumb on the right nostril. I have problem with right and left. Okay, let's do this. Right Ready? thumb on the right nostril. Okay. Exhale from the left nostril. Inhale from the left nostril. No, yes, and switch and exhale from the right nostril, yes. Then you inhale from the right nostril, switch, exhale from the left nostril. You got it? I got it. That's what you're doing. And these two fingers, you can put it on the middle of your eyebrows. So it's like supporting you, resting your arms. Mm. You continue this, inhale from one nostril, switch, exhale from the left nostril, inhale from the right nostril, switch, exhale from the left nostril, and now do it with your eyes closed, inhale from the left nostril, Switch, exhale from the right nostril. Inhale from the right nostril. Switch, exhale from the left nostril. 
and continue at your own pace three more rounds deeper breath breathe in fully fill up your lungs switch exhale fully relax your navel two more rounds breathe in with a smile even if you have to fake it switch exhale and final round breathe in with enthusiasm switch exhale inhale exhale and relax your hands keep your eyes closed spine straight arms on the laps and observe your breath long deep breath in and slowly breathe out in this state of silence let us remember our near and dear ones family members and friends and send them your love and blessings so they can be happy whenever they are happy we are happy with a smile on your face breathe in and let go and slowly gradually become aware of the surroundings become aware of your body move your fingers move your neck and we may gently open the eyes thank you How was it it was amazing i learned this okay thank you yeah so it's just alternate nostrils like you are breathing in from one exhale from the other inhale from one exhale from the other this synchronizes <laughs> both the lobes of your brain so left brain and right brain are connected with the nostrils yeah so, i actually feel more clarity actually that's great because yeah, so whenever your mind is in a chattery space if you do this alternate nostril breathing you will observe that your mind chatter comes down yes right uh dean there's a comment from dean saying watching Watching remaster the last exercise was was worth the cost of admission. <laughs> Dean, yeah, that's a good joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> see, see, Mandar, it was good to struggle with it a little, and so helping everyone learn together. You should um, go to Bollywood. You know, you should go to Bollywood. I think you'll be a good Bollywood actress. You are good. Thank you. Uh, Thank. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, many. Have you considered, have you considered that career or no? <laughs> <laughs> no no but a lot of my friends in palestine tell me that there i look like a lot of the indian actresses yeah yeah uh, yeah so maybe if i move to india at some point in my life who knows <laughs> yeah you haven't been yet no but okay. maybe ah we should tell the rag for beast members uh that we are considering maybe uh, making this trip to india available also to all of you we have not yet finalized the details but we're exploring that possibilities so if you are interested in that please contact us at contact uh, at rotariansforpeace.org so maybe we can plan a journey especially for rag for peace members who are willing to enjoy and take that journey of gandhi of uh, martin luther king um to to learn from from India and take the nonviolence um, philosophy. After COVID, 
after COVID. After COVID, yeah. So if you are interested in such program, please let us know so we know what to plan for and what you're interested in. Okay, Mandar, do you do you want to share anything about your dream or unpack before we wrap this up? I think there are many dreams. So I would say there are many dreams, but one of the dreams that is achievable is uh, to find like-minded friends who are interested in building their capacity for becoming brighter lights of compassion and peace and nonviolence. And if you are inspired by what I have done here at Shell, if you work in an organization, how can we bring this inner peace aspect in your own organization? And if you are interested in the community's work, how can you become a more mindful leader so that you can do what I'm doing in LA? You can bring it in Baltimore, Mexico City, like all these places of violence. How can you and your Rotary group can be more bright light in the you know, dark spaces that we live in and bring hope to the communities we live in? Schools, if you're working in a school as an educator, uh, schools, children and teachers are so stressed. In, in these times, in the workshops, if you know a health worker, if you know a doctor or a nurse, invite them as your guests to that workshop next week and the week after. They are doing so much selfless work. They're not looking at skin color, you know, your religion, your age. They are serving. That's such a beautiful quality they are demonstrating. Thank you so much, Mandar. I am inspired by your dream to empower as many people to bring peace, inner peace to their hearts and then to others in their communities because there's violence everywhere and there's opportunity for peace builders to um, alleviate the pain of violence by bringing peace to to that to those uh, contexts. So, Mandar, I wish you a wonderful day. I don't want to keep you any longer. Thank you for all our members. Uh, enjoy the rest of this um, Friday and happy weekend to all of you. Yeah, stay safe and stay home and uh, make other people stay home. <laughs> okay, great. Bye. Thank you, Anna and Reem. The you are a good interview. Oh, I need Thank to. I forgot to thank my uh, the production team, Anna, Anis, Daniel. Thank you, Anna De Silva, Anis Zaman, and uh, Daniel Hollis. You are an amazing team. I love you, and I love all the members who've attended to make this webinar, uh, you know, continue and exist. To yeah, exist and I, Anna brought the slides in at the beautiful timing. Like it was great, Anna. Thank you. Yes, great problem. Thank you all. See you next week. See you, bye. Yeah, Carlos, namaste and take care. Carlos from Mexico.